So climate risk can really be split into two components. It's the physical risk and the transition risk. The physical risk is really the climate change impact on your asset. That might be in terms of rising temperatures or heat stress, might be in terms of increased flooding and what the valuation impact might be on your asset. Transition risk is really about how prepared the business is to transition to a low carbon economy. And that's really the impact of policy and regulations. For example, if you look in the EU at the recent Fit for 55 package, that's really designed around making carbon prices more important as a mechanism for decarbonizing the European economy. In terms of risks and opportunities, clearly it's skewed more towards the risks. In the short term, you've got the cash flow impact. In the longer term, as I mentioned, stranded assets. But in order to have a stranded asset, something needs to replace that. And infrastructure investors have been very active in the transition to a low carbon economy in terms of renewables, energy storage, and also more and more in terms of the production of zero carbon fuels. I guess the first step is always uh, understanding exactly what your risks are. If you don't know what your risks are, then you're not going to be able to mitigate them. So I would say the key components of that are doing a carbon footprint to understand the carbon intensity of your assets. And secondly, to understand how resilient uh, your portfolio is, particularly in relation to, to physical risk. And in, and in terms of the physical risk, actually, there are more and more tools out there that allow you to really test the resilience of your of your asset. For the transition part of the equation, a little bit more difficult, but every management team should be thinking about um, transition risk and around the risks and the opportunities. A framework that I like is the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. And that's a really practical framework for identifying the risks and opportunities around uh, climate change and, and the transition to a low carbon economy. You, you will have seen that the G7 recently um, mandated uh, climate related reporting uh, as mandatory. And I think more and more we're going to see this as being the standard in the infrastructure sector over the coming five years or so. Well, in the short to medium term, it's the impact of carbon prices. We've seen prices double over the past 12 months. We've seen an increased focus from the EU as using this as a tool for decarbonisation. Now, so far, the power generation sector has been the only real sector that's affected the infrastructure community. And actually, to date, the increase in carbon prices has largely been reflected in an increasing wholesale power price, so broadly netting it off. I think that will change in the future as free allowances reduce and also the carbon price increases. And in the short term, you know, infrastructure investors may be able to pass on the increased carbon cost to end users, but clearly in the long term that erodes the competitive position. It also lowers the gap between currently more expensive low carbon uh, alternatives. So clearly that's the main risk um, for infrastructure investors. But clearly we've seen in, in, in Europe that the Commission sees this as a key tool in the decarbonisation agenda. Uh, in North America I think it's fair to say that we're still some way behind. So we have some um, carbon trading schemes in Canada and a couple of cap and trade schemes in states across the US. Um, but those prices are probably still too low to have any meaningful change, especially um, with cheap shale gas and, and really implementing a carbon regime in a, an economy that's very dependent on oil and gas is clearly challenging. I don't see a convergence and a, and a kind of a global carbon um, policy. But saying that, you know, there are some cause, causes for optimism. We've seen those carbon prices rise in, 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 across the US. We've also seen institutions like the American Petroleum Institute saying they would back a carbon tax 
and also we're seeing more states uh, exploring potential schemes. So, you know, cause for optimism, I think, but still quite a big gap. Yes, we still see um, quite a big difference. European investors have been really driven by the European Sustainable Finance uh, Disclosure Regulation, which came out in March, which is really designed to facilitate capital towards sustainable products. And that comes with um, investment requirements, but also a host of disclosure requirements. And if you're investing in a North American asset, it can actually be quite difficult to get the company to produce some of these uh, indicators because really it's not required directly by North American investors. We should say that the while Europe is very focused on the E or the environmental part of ESG, the US is much more a uh, well-established regime around focusing on the S or the social and also being able to, to demonstrate and, and monitoring progress against those objectives. I think it's a huge uh, undertaking uh, with private market companies to make the level of disclosure that the new regulations are requiring. I think they've been designed with public market companies in mind. You have large teams of you know, data analysts and investor relations personnel working uh, on this. The European regulation, for example, has 16 indicators that you need to and comply with and report on on an annual basis and a lot of the time we're spending at the moment is working with our companies to get them ready to report uh, on all of these metrics because it's a regulatory um, requirement so I think that it is uh, quite an, uh, an undertaking and, and a big impediment to um, investors launching sustainable products I would say the infrastructure sector in general should be well suited to um, to sustainable uh, products, especially around the, the energy transition, the digital infrastructure space, so a well-placed in that respect.